Our scripture reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, and I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Brothers and sisters, we want to let you know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. While they were being tested by many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford and even more than they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. They urgently begged us for the privilege of sharing in the service for the saints. They even exceeded our expectations because they gave themselves to the Lord first and to us, consistent with God's will. As a result, we challenged Titus to finish this work of grace with you the way he had started it. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspired in you. Here ends the reading. Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. I love solving problems in my life. I love coming up with creative solutions for things. It's one of the things that I enjoy with, Enjoy is, is coming up with an answer to a problem. But sometimes when I'm stressed or overwhelmed, and maybe you can relate to this, I solve my problems by spending money on something. Have you ever done that? And, and the other problem is like because I spend time on Facebook and TikTok, sometimes an advertisement convinces me to spend money to solve a problem I didn't even know I had, right? You know, I watch the advertisement and I'm like, oh yeah, that is a problem. I should buy that product. The problem with it is the worst part of it is not that there's any, any problem with buying things to solve a problem, is that sometimes it, it doesn't actually work out that way. How many of you, if, if you're a, a book lover like I am, how many books do you have at home that you haven't read yet? Right? Don't ask me about mine. I'm not ready to confess that much to you. Or, or I have a product that I thought, oh, I'll use this to teach my kids how to fold clothes. <laughs> that never happened. Right? And so now, instead of solving a problem that I had in my life with this product I bought, now I just have another problem because now I got to figure out where to put the product I bought and to store it or how to get rid of it, right? How to donate it or recycle it. Did you know? Did you know? We found this out. Uh, the ad board met with a man from Horizon Stewardship, and he told us that most Americans live at 120% of their income. 120% of their income. Now, now that math ain't mathin', right? Right? That's not a sustainable way of functioning in the world. But so many of us do it, and we might be surprised at who does it at who lives at 120% of their income. We might not recognize them when we meet them on the streets, right? Because they're, do you remember that old commercial? This just popped into my head. It's the dude with like the huge house and the white picket fence, and he's riding around on a riding lawnmower, and he's talking about how great his life is, and then he's like, and I'm drowning in debt. Somebody help me, please. I think it was like a credit card commercial, which I found deeply ironic that the credit card was gonna help with your debt. But anyways, that should tell you how old I am, because I remember when that came out, we all thought it was funny. A lot of Americans are living at 120% of their income, spending money they don't have to spend. And I would be willing to bet that most people who are living that way, they're not spending money on stuff they need. Right, they're spending money on the thing that's gonna solve whatever problem they've identified. Right? Or that the advertisements have helped them identify. I didn't even know that was a problem. Sure, I should buy that product. It's too easy. Paul is writing what we think is a letter, a fundraising letter to the Corinthian church. 
There's some scholars who believe that, that because Paul hasn't talked about fundraising before this letter, that this is actually a separate letter that was just added together into the Corinthian, into the second letter of Corinthians, right? That chapter eight and chapter nine are two fundraising letters. And when I read that, it cracked me up because we just got done with our stewardship campaign and I am wondering how that would have gone over if one of the letters y'all would have got was Broadway. Let me tell you about Salem United Methodist Church and how much money they gave, right? Does this seem like an effective fundraising strategy to you? No, right? Except, I'm not gonna do this as a fundraising strategy, except in Paul's case, I love what Paul does. Paul talks about the, ex, the grace that the Macedonians experienced because of their generosity. It's almost as if what Paul is talking about is not a dollar amount, but giving to the point that the Corinthians would experience the same grace that the Macedonians experienced in their generosity. And imagine what it takes for people, we know that at the time, or we guess that at the time, there's a couple times where uh, Macedonia went through seasons of drought and famine, and it kind of sounds like that's the season that they're in. And I love what Paul said about they begged to be part of the giving to the greater mission of the church. As far as we can tell, Paul discouraged them to participate in the giving because they were so poor, but they didn't want to miss out on this grace that God had for them. Now, the thing that our, our, um, the person who prepared our sermon series did is he stopped the reading too soon because we miss the why. And so I want to keep reading for you. I'm not giving an order, but mentioning the commitment of others. I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for our sakes so that you could become rich through his poverty. The grace that the Macedonians experience through their generosity and the grace that Paul is attempting to invite the Corinthians to experience is based on the sacrifice and generosity of Jesus Christ. I told you at the start of worship that today is Christ the King Sunday. And I, that's not language that we use a lot here in the U.S. When we talk about kings and queens and monarchy, it's because we're, we're usually watching what's happening in the United Kingdom unfold, right? That's usually the kings and queens that we're paying attention to here in the U.S. And they don't really have any authority over us anymore, but we're still kind of fascinated by them. And there are a lot of people who are in the church, uh, scholars, I'll, I'll say, scholars and pastors and students in seminary that think we should get rid of king language for Jesus, that we should quit using this language because it's wrapped up in all this complicated stuff in the world, right? Kings and queens have not always been the nicest people. They have not always been the kindest people to the people that they're supposed to rule over. Can we agree on that? Right? We're a nation that decided we didn't like the king, and so we bucked off his authority. So we can agree that kings and queens are not always the people that we want to follow, and so people think, oh, we should just get rid of this king language. Except, except that when we put king language next to Jesus, we get a new definition of the word king, right? Right? rather than a new definition of the word, Jesus. And so Jesus is the king who comes not with authority and command, not under pomp and celebration, not in demanding that we give him more money. Jesus comes sacrificing himself for our sake. Jesus changes what it means to be king. And because of Jesus' generosity and generous example, Paul is calling the churches to be generous themselves. Generosity is one of the few things in the Bible, there's probably a couple, but I would say it's one of the few things that is both a spiritual discipline and a spiritual gift. 
It is both a spiritual discipline and a spiritual gift. A spiritual discipline are those things that we do not to earn our way into heaven, but to position ourselves to receive grace. How many of you are sports fans? Any kind of sport. I don't, I don't care what it is, right? You have to move your, if your sport involves some kind of projectile, ball, puck, right? You have to move your body to receive the projectile or to block the projectile. Can we agree on that? Do I understand my sports ball rules enough, right? I had to teach my son that he wasn't scoring goals in basketball, so I do know that. We talked about what he could call it besides that. But we move our bodies, right? That's a spiritual discipline. A spiritual discipline is not earning something. It's positioning ourselves to receive the grace of God. That's what it is. Does that make sense? And the grace comes as a free gift to us. So generosity as a spiritual discipline is a choice that we have to make because budgeting and the way we spend our money is an exer- it's a discipline, right? If we don't want to live at 120% of our income, sometimes we have to say no to buying that thing, right? To stay within a budget. I hope some of you have a budget. Um, we're, we're getting there. Mark and I are still learning how to budget, but we're getting there. Actually, we're, we're still just remembering to bring our receipts home so we can tell somebody how much we spent before the credit card statement shows up. But generosity positions us to receive the grace that God has for us. By living at or below our means so that we can be generous with our money, we can more acutely experience what Jesus did for us on the cross. By making our own sacrifices, we position ourselves to more acutely experience what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's a spiritual discipline that opens us up to the grace of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual gift in that some of us are enabled to really, all of us, I'll just say all of us, all of us are enabled to dramatically change lives through what we have to offer. The spiritual gifts, if you remember, by Paul and from Jesus are meant for the building up of the body of Christ. They're meant for the equipping of the saints. Now we're told that what the Macedonian church and the Corinthian church is, this collection is for the poor in Jerusalem. So they are sending their gifts to the Jerusalem church in order to support the ministry that's happening there. They are building up the body of Christ. And so generosity becomes a spiritual gift in which they participate in the mission and ministry that God has for the church. Now let me give you the really good news. Psychology has confirmed that this works that this stuff works. There are two kinds of happiness. Did you know that? Did any of you know that? Did some of you know that? There are two kinds of happiness. There's hedonic happiness. Anybody ever been called a hedon? You don't have to tell me if you have, it's okay. But it is a type of happiness. It's a sense of well-being. It's a sense that life is going exactly the way you want it to go. This is the idea of happiness that most people struggle with, right? Because we live in a world of keeping up with the Joneses. I don't care how old you are, this has always been a problem in the U.S., right? Keeping up with the Joneses. Someone's got it better than me, so my life must not be going that well. This is called hedonic happiness. If we're generally happy, that day-to-day happiness, if we're generally content with how life is going, we have this sense of happiness, but it's a roller coaster. And it's all about context and perspective. There's another type of happiness called (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong, eudaimonic happiness. Eudaimonic happiness. This comes from a sense of purpose, a sense of living according to one's values, a sense of being connected to something greater than yourself. This is a type of happiness that cannot be shaken by what's happening in your day-to-day life. 
And this is the sense of happiness and joy that I think Paul is talking about when he says, the combination of the Macedonian church was extreme happiness and extreme poverty. Those things don't go together if we stop at hedonic happiness, do we? Do they? But to experience something that says, there's something happening in my life that is greater than me, that is according to my purpose, that is according to the values I've stated that I have, and I'm using whatever financial gifts I can to participate in that. See, here's the, the shadow part of using money to solve problems that we know we have or problems that we were convinced by an advertisement that we think we have, is that it never actually solves the problem, does it? It never, maybe it makes your shelves a little more organized or maybe it makes your skin feel a little more moisturized in the winter, but it doesn't last. It doesn't last because what we're actually searching for is that eudaimonic happiness. The happiness that means we're living according to our values. That we're participating in something greater than ourselves. We are wired. We've been talking about our spiritual DNA. We are wired to be generous. There's a reason almost every major religion talks about giving money to the poor. It's not just because we believe the poor should have food and heat and housing. We do believe that. But we as human beings are wired in our core to be generous to one another. To be generous to something greater than ourselves. And it is my prayer that as we enter this season where we celebrate generosity, that we would find ways to live more generous lives throughout the year, that we would stop and think about that money we're about to spend and say, is this really where I want it to go? Is this really where I want it to go? Or is there somewhere else that I could use these funds that would give me joy that lasts beyond my external circumstances, that would allow me to more fully experience the grace of God? Amen? Amen.